Hello and welcome back. I'm Diane Strickland and this is part two of the resource Reentry to Gathered Worship in Buildings. What do you think about when you look up in the summer at a night sky stuffed with stars? Most of us go silent and we realize how vast and unfathomable the universe really is. And just about at that moment, a light will start to move across the sky. A satellite that we put there. That makes me think about all the space travel stories from my lifetime. And I remember learning about the perils of re-entry to the Earth's atmosphere and the tremendous care and skill it took to get the angle of re-entry just right. The first video on re-entry for gathered worship in buildings offers a trauma-informed approach to factor in the known and unknown impact that this pandemic has had on everyone, individually and collectively. If you still aren't sure how much from that first video applies to your setting and your community of faith, it's probably wise to err on the side of caution, recognizing that things have changed for people, but we don't always know how much until we bump into it with an assumption that isn't there anymore. Carrying forward individual and collective insights into the actual process of decision-making and implementation is important so we can bring along as many people as possible and that's the focus in this video. This video is meant to help us find the right angle of approach in what is an unsettling and traumatic time for us. Working inside a traumatic event as a leader who is also in the same traumatic event, which is what we are doing, is a new challenge for most of us. And I have emphasized the need for self-awareness um, in the last video, but also in all my Zoom workshops to help leaders know how to participate in God's love for them in this stressful time. So what I'm saying here is that we not only shouldn't make assumptions about other people, we shouldn't make assumptions about ourselves either. We need the right angle too as leaders. Each community will have its own way of assigning the work of re-entry, um, investigation and recommendations and decisions and preparation and implementation. For some, it's the governing body. For others, it's a special task force or some other combination. Whatever works for you is what you should do. It is important, however, that people who will be leading re-entry worship, either your ministry personnel and or other uh, staff members or key volunteers who participate there need to be consulted and kept in the loop as you go along and have their concerns heard if they're not in the working group itself. So bearing all of those things in mind, this video looks at four things. The first is the crucial task of weaving spiritual practices into the work and the plan that you create. The second is all about gathering information, the different kinds of it, the challenges that are inherent in that, and the limits that we might face. The third is about using risk assessment and risk management in your process, how to do that and how to do it in a holistic way. And the last one is about creating a storyboard to create your plan so that all the bases are covered. So that's what we're going to do in this video, and here we go. We talked about spiritual practices in the last video. They can help us to break through the anxiety that we are having and that we might be bringing to the question of re-entry. Whether the anxiety is about we need to get back to normal and we need to do it fast or we need to stay closed until there's a vaccine, 
we need to break through the anxiety in order to be able to talk about it with each other and work with it faithfully in our process. Every community of faith has lay and ordered leaders who have gifts and skills for this. Some of them have trained for it specifically. These are the people who can help us know where these practices in this process belong so that they will comfort, engage, strengthen, challenge, and inspire our communities of faith. You can start by identifying those people in your community of faith, a small group perhaps, maybe only two of you, and pooling all the practices that you know that you have at your fingertips, the ones you use, the ones you love the best, the ones you know this congregation of people really like to use, they've used them before, all the ones you've known that you might not have used before but could find a place here. Now that list could be really long because there's a lot of great options. Dive in, pull some out, and see what you've got to work with. Now, given that some of us are struggling with things that we used to do really easily, if you find this too overwhelming right now, I am suggesting a few that I think are simple and doable and you can use them throughout this process. And the first one I would suggest is mindful or intentional breathing. I do this really simply, which is to breathe in through my nose to the count of five, pause, breathe out to the count of seven, pause. And I'll do five of those for a cycle. That is my go-to tool. And it's a wonderful way to dial down anxiety and your heart rate, to bring focus to what you're doing or to what a group is doing, um, and to help us all feel more grounded and, and less kind of all over the place, which this kind of crisis can bring out in us. So that's the first one, mindful or intentional breathing. The second one is a lament as a form of expression. You might want to check out the book of Psalms because there's lots of Psalms of lament there and you can use that format uh, for naming the losses that we discover and we know, the anxieties that people have, the feelings of anger and grief and frustration. The Psalms are a wonderful resource for this because they tell us that it doesn't matter how intense those things are or the harshness of how our lament sounds that God is up to all those things. So that's a wonderful spiritual practice to use a lament along the way. Another one is simply what I call moving in prayer. And this gives us an option to combine prayer with another activity. Uh, now, People who are in the prayer shawl ministries of our church, they're already doing this. They're praying as they knit or as they crochet those shawls. So the prayer is inside the shawl with that. Uh, we might want to do that if we have a yoga practice as well, to pray as we do that, to pray as we walk, to pray as we garden or shovel the snow. I pray while I do free motion quilting, and it has greatly improved my free motion quilting. It's the combination that helps us to overcome feelings of immobilization or powerlessness or trying to get the words right. It's, it's something that seems to work well and release our language and how to talk about what we need to talk about in prayer. The fourth one is about practicing silence. This is really important as we try to prepare ourselves to listen to other people who may have a different point of view or something we've never thought of before. And we need to do that without needing to jump in, uh, to respond immediately. So to use a practice of silence to just wait with people while they tell you what's happening for them, what they feel and think. It's about holding someone else's words in silence with them. 
but it's also a key practice uh, for us to use to hear ourselves and to feel ourselves throughout this whole process because we too have to recognize what's happening inside us and to be able to respond with acceptance and compassion. So we're not trying to shove things away or deny that they're there. We can say, I accept that that's what it's like for me right now. And I will choose to love myself the way God loves me in order to keep going. Practicing silence. And the last one is to create rituals to interrupt anxiety and that will move us through the day from one task to another. And this may involve some of the practices I've already named. So for example, you may stop to use breathing to, to, uh, before you do something, after you do something. You may choose to use Sabbath uh, practice, a practice of resting in God, even if it's for 20 minutes a day. Uh, you do it uh, to break things up and interrupt the accumulation of stress and anxiety. You may choose to journal with gratitude every day uh, at certain times of the day to, to help bring you back um, to a, an awareness of God at work in the world in positive ways. These are interruptions for us, ritual interruptions to uh, the accumulation of stress and negative emotions sometimes. These all, these five things, all have possibilities for individual and collective life working through the time and the process of re-entry, decision-making, preparation, and planning and implementation. So if you're not sure where to begin, there's five to work with. What I hope you will hear in this is me pointing you to things that you know already, um, that you already do, and realizing how important they are making them into real resources for this new situation we're in. Some of you, as I said, have, have t studied and trained for this all your life, and this is a good moment for you to bring it forward. It's a critical resource. Some folks, sure, may never do these things, even if we put them in front of people. But what I've learned is that in a traumatic event, while some people may become a little more rigid for their own way of managing what's going on, others will become more open to trying something different. So providing ideas for spiritual practices and helping people to pace themselves and support themselves, whether you know whether they do it or not, it doesn't matter. It's out there. You've put it out there. And you may be surprised to discover who uses it. It helps people to participate in the whole process and express their investment in it too. As we talk more into the video, um, please think of spiritual practices that, that might work in the categories I suggest. And I'm, I'm going to put a few in a few spots just to spark your imagination as we go along. We can move engagement to a deeper level to receive information, to respond to questions, to process options and consider risk, and to test plans, and then to live into them with faith. And leaders who will model these practices also engender trust and a spirit of collaboration. The crucial task of weaving spiritual practices into everything we're doing is something for us to pursue. When we talk about gathering information, um, we're first going to talk about 
the information about regulations and the virus and guidelines and regional and local facts that you need to constantly be uh, acquiring and updating. And this, of course, is where we run into this really unhappy dynamic of instability in our data, in our conditions. So while in another task, this might have been a straightforward piece of work, in this task, it is bigger and more stressful. So we may need to divide up different sources of this kind of info and assign them separately so that no one gets just overwhelmed with the instability of everything. And along with that, an important recording task for people doing this work is to date the information they're giving you as they record it so that we can know how far back that report goes and whether we need to check for an update on anything in it. Because in an environment of data instability, dating information has become critical. I'm hearing already that this area of the whole reentry process uh, can take over and bog down the whole group. Distributing information and educating everyone is turning out to be one of the most challenging parts for us. We may need one or more people with special skill and ability in this to review data as it comes and to determine where it may matter to us and to keep a large file folder and a binder with everything in it, but don't ask everyone to read everything, just to pull out the information a group needs for each piece that they're doing, because the group may never get past reading stuff if we just keep giving them the latest article on this. Someone needs to simply make point, bullet points on what we need to know that's new and date it. So assigning someone to edit materials and help the group from being um, bogged down also helps them avoid accusations or suggestions that they're slow, that they're indecisive, and they're not leading. Um, that's a truly tricky part of this. So learning a, a very purposeful way to handle information gathering about this kind of information, that's, that's actually a key step before you find yourself just walking through mud with all of it. The second area where you need information is from your community of faith. And uh, taking the temperature of your people is a good place to start. You may want to use an online survey monkey or a mail out survey or in a phone survey where needed, or if you need to visit individuals, a safe social distance visiting to elicit their responses to certain questions. Um, this, this may be what we need to do. You use multiple choice, you use rankings from one to five or one to 10, telling them which end of the scale means what. Um, a fill in the blank format, and always include other so that people can tell you what you haven't asked them that they want to tell you. This is about uh, a big piece of how to understand where the anxiety is in your congregation, how it's operating, what matters most to people when they're thinking about re-entry. So here's a few questions you might want to start with and you know massage them so they fit your setting. Um, the first question might be, what have you missed most about worshiping in the building? So you might suggest um, things they can check off, like singing or connecting in person with everyone, the fellowship after worship, uh, children's time, the building in itself, or things inside the building they might want to name, the choir, um, the personal energy of the worship leader, the spontaneous things that happen in worship that make it really special sometimes, that communal sense of God being with us together, um, all those kinds of things that happen in worship give people a chance to check them off and always include that category of others so they can write down the one you forgot. <laughs> and then you can ask them to rank the top three things where one is the most important. 
Um, this question helps you to know what prep work you have to do in, for things that they might not be going to get in reentry worship. Um, and you know what? It also provides content, content for your lament if you're thinking of using that as a spiritual practice. A second question is to ask um, what has worked well for you uh, and even maybe surprised you that it worked so well in the provisional worship program that you have been using. So, for example, they might want to check the um, flexibility of the timing. Uh, they can watch this service anytime and they can watch it more than once. They can send a link to their friends and family. Uh, they may have really enjoyed the creative ways that um, worship leaders have used to make it more personal. Um, how music was was added, and over the time, how it got you know they got more creative with that and discovered more things they could do. How outdoor settings added, or the setting of the using um, the building and uh, the church building for the setting, really comforted people just to see their church building again. <clears throat> Another thing might be that we have reached new people online than, than we used to, and that, that sort of opening up ideas about how we might be able to go forward with that in a new ministry. And then again, choose the top three things for people. Ask them to do that. And this, this provides um, a way to recognize and honor the people who have done all that work on those services to be able to say, look at how much these things are appreciated and to celebrate how the spirit has been working and has been effective. Um, and there are, there's content here for this spiritual practice of uh, gratitude um, in journaling, for example. The next question uh, would be, where does your anxiety about the community of faith gather in this pandemic? For example, you might want to ask if it's about finances, if it's about keeping people safe from the virus, if it's about what's happening to our mission, um, our relationships with each other, um, whether we can keep or attract a new minister in these circumstances. You know, a need, a feeling that we need to get back to um, normal routines whether people are detaching from their commitment to the church, um, how we can best support our staff, dealing with grief together through all of this and the deaths that our community has faced and other losses along the way, not being able to celebrate all the good and wonderful things that happen, uh, weddings and births and awards and special anniversaries, etc. Whether people are getting the pastoral support that they need in these circumstances, um, making sure our seniors and our shut-ins are well looked after and attended to. So you make a list of things like that and always and choose other because you make sure somebody might have something you didn't name and ask them again to rate the top three things. So this content helps us to know what may stand in the way of our common work if we cannot name these things and respond to them some way. In other words, re-entry is a, a piece of work, but if these things linger, uh, we may not be able to re-enter with as much success as we want. And there's also content here for um, intercessions and prayer in motion, and also for the practice of silence, just in listening to it and holding what people tell you for a time before you respond. Another question to ask is, what worries you most about re-entry worship? Um, you may hear, include options like, someone could get sick and die, um, that we won't be able to follow all the rules, we'll forget, that some people will make it more difficult than others, um, that all the things we can't do will defeat the rest that we can do, that people won't give it more than one try, that there'll be too many complaints, um, that there's no end of regulations and we'll just lose interest because we'll have to keep adding another one. 
that people will make mistakes and there'll be um, slips and they'll be embarrassed and um, self-conscious about being corrected, that we might not be able to have children with us. Will we grow impatient with the situation and with each other? That all the people that we've connected with online who don't come to church and never came to church, that they'll just sort of be dropped off the radar in this decision. And of course, a category of other. Choose, invite people to choose their top three things where one is the most important. This helps us to learn where we can be proactive as we work towards a decision and possibly prepare to plan re-entry. What spiritual practices can help us carry these worries with us? How can we empower people by directing their investment into the work of re-entry decision-making, planning, and implementation? Is it a chance for us to recruit people to interrupt these anxieties and pray for each person in the work together? Can we ask people to provide this kind of support as we move through that work now that we know what all the anxieties and concerns are? In your surveys or interview questions, indicate that their responses will help the whole group know where to focus attention and provide support to the whole community of faith. Some responses may be gathered and re-expressed in various formats or reporting documents so the whole community of faith can know the whole temperature of everything along with the working group or the governing body. And the last area of information is in informal reporting. So in the other video, I suggested that people would, would be able to let you know where they'd picked up anxiety from others. And again, this is not about identifying anybody who said anything. It's about knowing our people and what is worrying them. So when presenting recommendations or a decision, it sometimes um, can be important to talk about those anxieties too and how they were addressed and will be addressed as you go along. Building trust sometimes mean we must name difficult things that are still unresolved in order to indicate that we know they matter. We don't always have what we need to resolve them in that moment, but somebody in the larger group might so we all need to know. Remember also to canvas your decision-making body and learn where their anxieties are, as well as sharing your own. Both the members, the adherents, and their leaders are experts about the community of faith. Reminding each other what past traumas might be triggered by this trauma what stress patterns and habits might arise along the way helps e leaders to equip, equip leaders to respond more effectively and anticipate all the possible problems. This is the stewardship of the information that you can know one way or another. People use risk assessment and risk management in lots of business settings. And I adapted a basic practice for traumatized people to use in personal decision making, and it also works for communities and faith. Having a process helps us to keep focused on facts, to stay in problem solving mode, and to become attuned to the capacity for absorbing risk in our communities of faith. In each step, I use six categories to ensure a holistic consideration of all the dynamics that can become drivers for success and failure. 
So those six categories are physical, emotional, social, spiritual, financial, and psychological dynamics. So here's how that risk assessment and risk management process works. Step one is identify a risk. Choose one of those six categories and what are the risks in that category? For example, a simple physical risk is that someone might get infected with the virus at our worship. And you want to go through all the six categories uh, to identify risk to make sure you get them all. Step number two is to list possible outcomes if that risk is realized. And again, you're actually looking at outcomes in every one of those categories for that one risk. So for example, the physical risk that someone might get infected, some of the categories of outcomes include things like people being devastated. That's an emotional category. They're re-traumatized, a psychological category. Um, a physical category is, well, they could get infected too, or they might have to isolate or quarantine. That's a social category. Um, they may have a crisis of faith. That's a spiritual category. Um, is there talk of lawsuits, or uh, do we find that key donors are threatening to leave? This is a financial category. So you're using the same cat six categories to list possible outcomes to that one physical risk. Then step number three is to estimate the likelihood of the risk being realized at all from one to 10. So one is no risk at all, 10 is pretty much a certainty. Um, and things like you know, your local case numbers, whether how many vulnerable groups you have in your community of faith, whether the, the folks that you're working with are really responding well to self-regulation responsibilities, all these help us to, to consider where our risk factor is. Step number four is to brainstorm ways to mitigate those outcomes. In other words, for example, if we have a psychological outcome about people being re-traumatized, well, let's look for a trauma professional and have them ready to help us if we need, so we don't have to go searching for one. We know the one we'll call. We may have some physical things we can do to add precautionary practices to guard people from infection. These are great things. We may be able to use contact tracing uh, people who attend to help stop the spread of the infection. Use the same six categories to look for ways to mitigate negative outcomes. Step number five, identify the core values that are at stake in that risk. For example, if one of your guiding principles going into this consideration of, of this question, um, the safety of all as a priority for your community of faith, well, that's at stake in this risk. And if you're not sure what those might be, you can look at your mission statement, you can look at a behavioral covenant you might have, or other operating documents which hold your core values. Uh, there may be some uh, core value material that came from your regional uh, offices or the, the national office of the church affirming certain values in this process. The point of getting at these is to understand that it's really important, even in a time of crisis, that a community of faith be faithful and true to itself around that risk. Step number six is to decide whether the out kind of outcomes or the likelihood of traumatization, mitigating options and the core values at stake make this risk too much for the capacity of your community of faith to absorb it. Assessing your risk and tolerance is something you've been doing all along. It's part of what you've been doing with the information you've been gathering, for example. So we don't want to be careless with that. And we need to remember that being reckless is a symptom of stress and a frustration in traumatic settings. So it may be important to have a script ready to affirm that there is a greater risk and tolerance in some members of the community 
while affirming that the leaders have to lead with a priority for the safety and well-being of everyone in that community. We also um, may want to ask if there are other risks that have more positive mission potential. For example, um, an idea to develop online worship um, programming options to further your relationships and connections with people that you've picked up by going online. That may be something to be considered as well here. You know, what are the identified risks with those ideas? Do the same risk assessment and risk management process to see if those risks can add value to the life of the community of faith in these difficult pandemic times. Finding traction for new mission to connect with others may add positive energy, and you may need that right now. But it also could be a focus for the positive energy of those who really would like to get back together and get going again in ministry. They can be a part of something moving forward if there's something else happening, a new direction to harness their positive energy um, and lead to possible breakthroughs in mission. Now, this risk assessment and risk management process, it, it may sound kind of difficult, and the first time through it may take time to get it all done. But let me assure you that once you get doing it, it becomes very simple and works faster every single time. Using risk assessment and risk management in such a serious situation um, does a number of things for us. It provides guardrails for considering a decision about re-entry with a common understanding of rational process. So it adds an element of safety to people as they're participating and leading because it's actually harder to hijack the process when we all know what it is. It ensures a holistic consideration of risks and outcomes and mitigation potential. So using those six categories I named means that, that every person's strength, that one or more of them, is going to be needed. So if we have one person who's really good at identifying emotional dynamics in play, there's their materials needed. If we have someone else who's really good with identifying uh, physical things in play, their stuff's needed. Everyone's strengths can find a place to land in this process. Also, it does allow you to look at risks that um, provide opportunity to the congregation, um, not just risks that you're trying to avoid harm. It also empowers people by giving them a language of those six categories to talk about the process and the decisions that you make, and it uses the rational capacity during a traumatic event, which sometimes can be in short supply. It helps everyone to talk to each other without allowing one category of risk to run everything. So it offers safety, transparency, collaborative and empowering process during stressful times. And you can just, you know, set up a, a spreadsheet to do your work, to record things and, and have it all organized so that you can refer to it as you go along. After you've done that, you're going to decide if you're ready to prepare a plan for re-entry or if it's too soon for your community of faith. Even if you do go ahead with re-entry, you need to also address if you're going to continue to offer online services or home worship service print resources because, as we know, some people may not be able to absorb the risk of going whether you decide they can or not. Um, so we need to also look at how much work that is adding to everyone who's involved, whether they're uh, key staff people or whether they're also key lay leaders in the church. Can they manage the additional workloads? Um, can we understand what we need to have them set aside in order to keep um, the work manageable within the hours that they have for it? And securing cooperation and agreement of all parties begins by, by treating everyone with respect and negotiating for any changes. Um, maybe having uh, scheduling a regular review time for what you're doing for staff and key lay leaders in worship 
so that you can look at, okay, this is working well, this I'm not, man, I thought I could manage this, but it's not coming out that way because this other thing has, has unfolded that I need to manage. So we need to really work closely with our staff and lay leaders and with possibly your M&P um, committee to uh, make sure everyone's respected and nobody is pushed beyond their means to fulfill their duties. Risk assessment and risk management. See, we really don't need to make up a process from scratch. One already exists and there's lots of versions of it. So if you have another version of risk assessment or risk management that might work better for your setting, go for it. I do invite you to put those six categories, however, into it if they aren't there already. Some basic rational process. I think it's sigh of relief all around. Long ago in seminary, I remember someone saying that public worship was the longest running, unrehearsed drama going on all over the world every week. So let's just take a bow for that, but also realize that in facing the question of re-entry to gathered worship in a building during a pandemic, we will need a different approach than the one we've using. So the idea of a drama unfolding leads me to consider using another available tool called the storyboard. Now you can do an internet search for a storyboard template. There's lots to choose from. Choose the one you like, download it and start using it. Start working with the story of your re-entry worship service. See it like a movie scene after scene after scene. Have an eye for how many worship stewards you might need in every scene. What signage is needed? What equipment has to be there? What preparation needs to happen? And for the folks thinking about spiritual practices, well, let's remember that there's spiritual practice of using stations like the Stations of the Cross. What could you add to each scene? if you thought of it as a station. Because if every person had a version of the storyboard, they would know what to expect and use a spiritual practice to prepare and engage. So here's how it might work. Scene one, reservations. We didn't used to have to do that for worship, but we have to bear in mind that our buildings, once they're marked off in seating for social distancing, we might, not, we might not be able to accommodate everyone. So if we can't have everyone in the building with regulated distancing at the same time, who gets to come? How is that facilitated in a fair manner? And do we actually want to offer more than one service? Because then that would mean we have to have cleaners in between them and two sets of stewards if we're going to do, twi tw do it twice. So scene one, reservations. Look at everything in there. Scene two, what about setting up a buddy system? Some folks go to worship on their own. And if all the permitted spots in their social bubble aren't used up, and let's remember that every region and area has a different number of people they're allowed to have in their social bubble, can they use one of their unused spaces and join up with someone else who's also going on their own and go together? So they're not on their own engaging this new worship. 
the protocols that may feel strange, forgetting things and feeling self-conscious when we really want them to be self-aware and not self-conscious. Buddies can help by reminding each other, encouraging each other, learning together, sharing what things feel like after, not just being alone in it. And for those who don't think they need or want a buddy, this is a ministry opportunity to support someone who does. We can make someone else feel better in this experience and be new in it together, collaborate and empower each other in the uncertainty and the newness of it. It's an opportunity to care for each other, whether we think we need it or not. Why, that's a spiritual practice, isn't it? Scene three, arrivals. Now, depending on your situation, you need to ask whether someone is needed to manage, for example, the parking situation. And if everyone parks at once, do we need a social distanced area where people can gather like a holding zone with, um, like they do at the grocery store before you can come in, sometimes you have to line up and wait in an area. And then there needs to be a steward to move people through just the way they do at the grocery store. Scene four, masking and disinfecting. Well, where does this begin? You know, if, if the church signed up as a mask distribution point and has masks to give out, well, who facilitates that? How do they do it? Um, what do we do if someone objects to putting the mask on and who handles? What's, what's your strategy at that point? You have to have a plan in place. So masking and disinfecting hands, how do we turn that into a spiritual practice? Scene five, entering the building, if you haven't done so already. Well, it's one-way traffic, no coming and going. Once you're in, you're in. Um, we need a transfer, uh, checking, transfer tracing check-in station there. So someone has to make a note of who's there and how we contact them. Um, and who's going to do that? And how will they do it in a way that is a welcoming thing and not intrusive? How can that become a spiritual practice for people? Scene six, the seating. Well, who makes sure people get somewhere that's safe? And how we do that without coming too close to them ourselves. Sometimes it's a frustrating thing when people want to sit in the same place every week. What my trauma work has taught me is that church is often the only place some traumatized people feel able to go. And that's because it is predictable. They create their own security by sitting in the same spot, for example. So let's not assume that people with those concerns are just rigid or superficial or whatever. I have learned um, that I'll, for some people, and in every age group I have learned it, some people the same seat is what makes it possible for them to leave their home and come. So some of the I must have my pew people are actually trauma stories that pre-existed the pandemic. So let's think about talking with people that we know do that to make sure maybe they need to come in and see what might work for them in the new socially distanced configuration and make sure it's saved for them so that they too are able to come and feel safe. Scene seven is worship content. You might want to start this with a covenant of care and respect for each other that is a part of every week that expresses the core values of what we're doing together in the new protocols for worship life. And we agree to it every week. Um, we may want to do something like put symbols on our communion table of the things that we cannot do together right now in worship, like a hymn book, a, something that symbolizes our children's time, um, you know, a coffee mug for fellowship time that we can't do afterwards. Um, all kinds of things that could go on the table and, and having them been named and maybe lighting a candle for each one of them. Um, those things can help us to remember that we haven't forgotten those things and that they're in a safe place. We are entrusting them to God and we may get them back even if we get them back in a different way. We honor them and what they mean to us. 
We may want to look at more action songs so people can participate in singing without making noise. Um, and no touch action things for exchanging the piece. All the various options there are for that. Uh, helping people to read prayers silently along um, as the leader leads. Maybe using mindfulness breathing as a part of gathering the worship together. Um, planning for what to do if people get confused or they're upset or they don't want to cooperate. You know, how are we going to manage that? And then when it's over, we need an uh, exit choreography in place so that everyone leaves in a socially distanced way and, and knows what, where to go next. And the next scene, this will be scene eight, I think, I've got, it's the aftermath. We've got to do cleaning, we've got to do disinfecting, um, and outside or somewhere else in the building, we may have that same waiting area where we are the holding place for social distancing people while we let people go to their cars in smaller groups so there's not a whole lot of people running into each other between cars and stuff like that. Um, and then scene nine is the test run where you've got it all designed and then you gather up some volunteers to do a walkthrough from start to finish. So you get feedback, you find out how things work, uh, they may have suggestions that are really good um, and concerns that they have that you didn't think of. Scene 10 is making any necessary changes and improvements that come out of your test run. And the, uh, scene 11 is, a, is you take that plan, the storyboard, and you distill it down from start to finish and, and give it to everyone so that everyone has an idea of what they can expect. There are no ambushes because we didn't tell people what it was going to be like. And when we do that, we are going to be asking them for their prayerful participation. We're going to be asking for worship steward volunteers that we may still need. Uh, we can thank people for all of the prayer and encouragement that it's taken to get here and how wonderful it has been to be held in that love um, as the people putting it together. And also reminding them that even though it's, we're started, it's not necessarily the last version of our worship service. We may need to work things out in the first few worship service and make additional changes and we'll try to let people know when that happens. Scene 12 is my favorite because it's when you figure out how to come up with something, some way of celebrating this together. Uh, whether it's you, you have a huge welcome banner, whether people um, are able to take something from the service, a memento, safely, uh, a, a candle, a something, uh, a note uh, of thanks to each person that's come. They leave with something that, that marks this occasion as an occasion of our faith, our common discipleship, and our desire and celebration of being back together in whatever form it has taken. So there's a few approaches and tools that contain and express all the principles of trauma-informed care, and they offer us a path through this extraordinary responsibility that we have. Take and try what seems helpful to you. If you have other resources to add them, by all means, bring them. Bear in mind that who you are right now, having lived through months of this pandemic, has changed you and try to be aware of that. Speak to the best part of each other 
except where changes have diminished uh, your and others' personal resources. Go slow. Rushing doesn't work so well in a traumatized setting that's still going on. Remember, this is also trial and error. We are all going to make mistakes. Accept yours with self-compassion and humility, and thanks to God for being able to fill in some of those gaps we create ourselves. Acknowledge those mistakes and move on. We may need to keep changing things as we go along, improving our safety, enriching our experience too. But you know, we don't really need a lot of critics. We need investors who are willing to be good stewards of a common investment. Let's find our best angle for re-entry, the one that attends to the safety, um, to the best of our rational ability, one that trusts God without tempting God, one that's ripe with opportunity for us to mature our faith and deepen our discipleship together, the one that celebrates and respects that holy mystery of all our beginnings and all our endings, and every moment in between. We are not alone. Thanks be to God.